Guys, can I tell you psyched? I, I don't know. Is that the right word? Psyched? I don't know. But first of all, let me just say thank you so much for tuning in to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. But well, the word I'm searching for, excited? Mm, not good enough. Mm, over the roof? Not good enough. Over the top? Not good enough. Why? Because of the guests that I have on this show today. My guest today is an actress and a comedian, a writer and a producer. She's in. She is an advocate for LGBTQ rights, mental health, and addiction. She grew up in New York, surrounded by her talented uncles, Keenan, Damon, Damon, Marlon, Sean Wayans. She studied filmmaking at UCLA and got her start in the entertainment business behind the scenes before transitioning to a role in front of the camera. She's currently in production on a comedy series titled Unconventional and headlining her, headlining her own tour, which is House Arrest National Comedy Tour. I'm talking about the one and only Shantae Wayans. Thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Hey. Hey. Montel, man, such a legend. So happy to be here. What's going on? I'm telling you, I just, I've been psyched about this interview with you for weeks since we first, somebody said, yeah, Shantae Wayans. I said, wait, wait, wait Shantae Wayans? Right. What? <laughs> Okay, come on now. That's what I'm telling you. I'm just, I just, I, 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 I've been kind of. Every time I think about you coming on today, I start chuckling. Now, what? <laughs> I mean, you are the one that's addictive. You are addictive as you can be. I mean, you know. So, I thank you so much for being here. You know, for a lot of people who don't know you, um, let's let's take a little journey. I love to go back a little bit in time and ask people and find out, you know, um, where you got your start. You're you you are from the New York from, area, right? Mm -hmm. I'm from New York. I actually uh, started out in the projects with Keenan and uh, well, let's say ten kids and uh, mm -hmm. my grandparents. And then uh, you know, throughout my my younger years, I really didn't want to be a part of this entertainment industry. I was I I, I dislike strongly uh, how. It felt like life was kind of taken away, you know, going out, trying to celebrate with your family or, you know, have dinners and not having privacy. Um, but the crazy thing is once I moved to California, it was a voice for me to enter into that world. Getting on stage and starting comedy, uh, it, it helped me in so many ways. But did you did you, did you know in your heart of hearts did you ever I mean were you were you the one that you know you were at a party and literally you look look to the right and left of you there's twelve people standing around you waiting to hear everything that came out of your mouth were you always funny? Uh, no, I was actually I mean I, I I was I guess I was funny but I was it wasn't what I really wanted I was into technology I wanted to uh, go into computer science I, I love things like that but I've always been open to to anything. Um, so I think, I think it was a little bit of fear, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. just trying to stay out of it, but cra crazy enough, I feel like it's in a lot of my family. But now when you look back on life, do you think to yourself, you know, every time I kind of look back and think about parties and other things that I've been at, you know, I did help people kind of enjoy their time. I mean, you know, crack a few jokes. <laughs> Are you good at that? Oh, no. I, I had an amazing time. I used to, I used to do pranks and like uh, trick people. This is this is when I was like in the closet still, but I, uh -huh. used, to, I used to make girls in some type of way like play with me without them thinking that I I like them. So gotcha. I had a lot. Of, <laughs> a lot and of and you, 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 I'm sure you did that by disarming them with a joke or a little comedy. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Like, ah, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they were like, don't you want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Years later, they was like, you really, you really meant that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let's, let's talk, I want to stay on growing up though, you know, so you're growing up in the midst of some of the funniest people who walk the planet. And what was that like? Was that the, the, that was that an impression on you? Did it make big impressions on you, or were you more a little bit reticent at the fact that with that power came so much attention, and you you hit it yourself? You do lose little parts of yourself, especially your privacy and things like that. I th I think it was a uh, a little bit in the middle. You know, for me, my family. We, we always had laughter. We always found laughter in the darkest moments. I remember one of my uncles passed away and um, 
I think they purposely set the funeral up to be like, it was like a pastor that was like way off topic uh, for my uncle. And, you know, we're like in the midst of tears. And then the guy who sings, he's just like this old uh, guy with a little suit on. <laughs> and he can't. <laughs> and so in the midst of tears, we are, we just start like crying of laughter. And I, and so I think that my family helped me get past tough situations and the things mm -hmm. that I've been through in life to forward to my future to be able to talk about it on stage. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you, you pursued a college degree. You went to uh, where um, UCLA, right? I, I did uh, like the extension course of it. So I, yes. I wound up getting like some uh, certificates, went out for a year. That was like more when I was doing computer science. I mean, um, editing, because when I'm going okay. out to Cali, that's what I was into post-production. And you got a lot of, you know, uh, good opportunities to start with several different uh, programs and shows behind yeah. the camera, right? Yeah. You were on Soul Train. Soul! Yeah, I did so. Donnie, I, I was in the um, the trailer with him while he was pressing the, directing the Soul Train Awards. <laughs> oh, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, you got yeah. to do that. You did several other stints. So, uh, name some of the other shows that you worked on. Well, I did. I did. Uh, uh, well, see, Montel, a lot of my stuff was behind see, uh, uh background work. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> okay. Naked, but I did Scary Movie. I did a dance flick. Um, I actually, my uncle did a, a cartoon uh, called Thugaboo, a boo crew. And mm -hmm. uh, I was I was a voice in that as Diane. So I, I did work my way up. And it's funny enough, in my two seconds of glory, uh, people recognized me then. <laughs> well, that's great. And then yeah. now, you know, when do you start to to feel as if, you know, partying got a little out of control? When did you start drinking? Oh, Montel, you're about to get some deep stuff right now. Got you, uh, girlfriend. We got you. <laughs> I'm, 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 we're going to have fun, but we're also going to get deep, okay? I never really uh, put this out there, but, you know, I got, I got, I was pregnant when I moved out here. And, uh, um, I got it. I did had an abortion, and it was one of my biggest regrets in my life. It was something that I didn't realize until I got older. Well, what that meant for me, but um, that that was the start of my drinking. I think that was like 22 years old, and that's that's when it was like it was absorbing because I knew I wanted to keep them. I knew I wanted to keep my child. I remember walking in that that hospital and seeing multiple girls surrounded by me. Like it was. You know, it felt so unreal that this many people was doing this, but out there doing something uh, not unsafely, but, you know, put a condom on if you're going to do it. <laughs> sure, uh, sure, sure. So it was something that really put me in a, in a dark place. And, and I, I believe that's that was the start of it. And so and there was it was it like a downhill spiral really quickly? It uh you know, luckily it was party days, you know, in the early years. So you were, you know, going out, everybody was drunk and stuff like that. And, and I think, you know, growing up and kind of being that introvert and holding a lot of things inside, um, I, I, I was getting all those feelings out and trying to stand up for myself with liquor. So I was very emotional and, you know, putting blame on, on people or things and, and not really having that clear, I, I wasn't healing. I was just trying to express myself for the years of pain that I went through. And were you at this same point in time, like trying to deal with your own internal struggles about your sexuality? What was going on? Well, that, that was something. So I came out when I was um, uh, about 19 before I moved to California. And so, you know, growing up in a Jehovah's Witness household, you still have those thoughts. You know, it's one of those things where you're going to come out the closet, but you better be sure you know, this is what you want to do. Um, I was trying to find myself in religion, uh, being baptized, being, you know, all these things. And coming out, I think the biggest struggle for me was uh, coming into the industry, b being a stud. And a stud is, you know, being more of the man in the relationship. So I was, you know, the more aggressive one and I would wear hoodies and stuff like that. So once I came into the, the industry, it was like, everything was like, you need to change. You need to do this. Don't talk about being gay on stage. Just, you could say it's a friend, but don't do you. So I think because I didn't feel like there was a lot of support around me to, to just be my authentic self. I think that was more of the struggle than just, you know, coming out as a lesbian who looks very feminine and sexy. Yeah. And now, and, and please, I'm, I'm, I only ask this question 
So you came out, but you were still having relationships with men, right? No. no. So no, no, no. So when I moved, when I moved out here, I'm sorry. I, so That's I moved right. out here at 19. I was pregnant. I, I was pregnant when I moved to Cali. So I say 22 was when I started drinking. But when I came out here, I literally told that guy as I was pregnant, I said, you know, I, I love you because I, I do believe people just love. I don't think that has a sex or anything. It's, it's more about that intimacy in the bedroom. Um, but I told him I love him to death. And but I wouldn't love him in the manner he would want me to. So, you know, there was talks of marriage him wanting to move out. And I was like, I mean, I just really love lady. <laughs> right, 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 right. And were you able to tell him that? Did you were you I, I was. I, I did tell him. And and the crazy thing is, I mean, we talk off and on uh till this day. Like I said, I love him. He was a, a great guy. Um, and and the fact that I know that I did love him, but I still didn't want to be with him was what made my choice even more solid, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, so I'm uh, sorry to, to bring back that memory, but right. you, you terminated that pregnancy and then you moved forward. Was it because of that termination that really started that cycle of drinking? Cause you were still trying to deal with, and along with that, the fact that you now just came out yeah, and all of the angst that was going on in our society back then, yeah, you you know you're trying. It's like you're trying to fit in. You know, I wanted to be one of the guys. I you know even in my family, like they all embraced us, but there was differences. And you know, guys hanging out with the guys and girls hanging out with the girls. And you know, I, I really just wanted to fit in and be that person. But you know, in the midst of that, you know, you hang around certain people, and they like, oh, she gonna bring all the chicks and you know all this stuff. And and I still. I'm so feminine at heart that like, I, I don't even know how to play that role. You know, I, I'm more the person that see a, a bunch of chicks looking good, ready to party. And I'm like, Hey, what y'all, what y'all trying to do with y'all life? You know, uh -huh. right, 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 right. <laughs> I'll make them go to college instead of coming mm -hmm. to the hotel room. <laughs> so, sure, sure. But it was, it was very, it was very difficult trying to take a stand. If you look at where we are right now, and back in the day, like being this stud, this aggressive looking girl, you know, there was threats. There was there was a whole other uh, way people were dealing with us. And now it's just free. You could be pretty much whatever you want. So it's it's a tough decision to make when you don't know what that future brings. So I'm either going to be in my head. I stayed the way I was the entire time because I felt like if I was going to be a part of a change, um, it might not be in my life, but maybe I can be there for somebody in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so, all right, so now you're 22, you start the spiral of alcohol. Were you dabbling in cannabis back then? I was, I was, I wasn't, um, it was, it was a little different at the time. Like I, you know, you, you have your, your liquor. I was also doing like ecstasy here and there and stuff like that. So you don't really know what's doing what to you. Um, but you know, then when they got the dispensaries, the, the potency and those things just got so much better. Right. And now do you do, well, clearly you don't drink anymore, but are you shifted over do even back then, did you notice that you were shifting over from alcohol to cannabis or how did you actually get sober from alcohol? Um, well, you know, this is, this is my fourth, fourth time round. Um, but what I will say is that, uh, marijuana for me is calming. You know, I've, I started, I, I got anxiety, um, started having anxiety when I was like on my wife and kids. Um, you know, just that racing of your thoughts and, and not being able to sleep. And a lot of those things, when I started smoking, um, it, it calmed all of that. It really, really did, especially my anxiety. I, I had this thing when when you don't release your or express yourself and what you're feeling or stand up for yourself or make boundaries. Uh, internally, you're like, <laughs> and you're 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 the anxiety like of being around people becomes too much. And and for right. me, like even not drinking, drinking was a way to be able to socialize and, you know, listen to people when that's draining for me a lot of times, um, or I could feel the energy. So marijuana for me calms that. It makes me be able to go around, still be aware and kind of be able to control that, that hyper energy. Right. Well, now, so as you were, you had just said you finished uh, your stint on my wife and kids and that ran for what, six years? Five. Five, five mm -hmm. years? 
Mm-hmm. And then when that finished, um, what made you decide, you know, I guess somebody on the show said, you know, girlfriend, you're pretty funny. You ought to, you ought to do an open mic night. Right? <laughs> somebody said that to you? No, um, Montel, I went to uh, the spot called the Ha Ha. Um, my cousin and this guy, Benny, was performing. My cousin, Lil Damon, we, they went to the uh, open mic. And I was in, as I was watching this open mic, I went home and literally thought about two jokes. And it just kept playing in my head. I was up all night and I was writing the jokes down. And I went back that night and I performed uh, for the open mic and they asked me to come back for the later show. Now the later show I bombed, but that's because I ain't had, I didn't write more jokes. Um, but that again, that was the start of going, yo, people got to listen to me. I have this platform and I can say what I want to say and I can make people laugh. Mm. It, was, it was over. It's therapy. And then you decided to go ahead and move from LA, go back to New York, right? To work on your craft. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> it was me trying to run away from myself from drinking. So okay. when I got sober originally, I was like, Cali, you know, I don't like Hollywood. It's just, you know, I was very New York in the manner of like, yo, I'm not going to be fake. Um, and so I went back home and it was like a lot of the people that I knew was still in the same place. So it really just, you know, I started drinking there and it, mm-hmm. I, I realized that I just took me <laughs> wherever I went. And it was about how I move in the environment versus moving to different environments to get away. But then you did work on your craft, though, when you got yes. back to New York. Yes. yes. So my, my apologies. I went well, to New York and, and that was that was actually the beauty is because, you know, in L.A., you might have a show or two uh, that you might be able to get on at one night. But in New York, you could have 15, 40 spots in one area and be able to hit as many as those mics that you want. So New York put that beast mode in me that, uh, oh, the joke don't work here. I still have time to get out and go do it somewhere else, you know? And so you were fine. You would, you would do it. Oh, that's really wild. I, you know, I, I visited a couple of comedy clubs in New York, but didn't realize that you were running from one stage to the next. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And the beauty is you get to see, you see uh, comedians of all calibers that's, that's doing it. It's not like, Oh, this spot is just for the people that's starting off. So it's a whole, it's a whole other vibe. Cause you like, yo, Dave Chappelle at the stand or, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, you would no. never really get that in, in Cali per se. Gotcha. And so I, I'm, it must be clear, but you, as you started to perform, you started hitting it out the park, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I started doing good. I, I still, you know, it took me probably like 11 years. I want to say to really find that voice because again, you're battling with, you know, I'm, I'm battling with people calling me just a gay comic and you know, that makes people go, I, I don't want to hear gay jokes, but it's like, I'm not talking about, what you might think I'm talking about. You know, my my whole purpose was to try to get men, like I understand what men go through dating women, but I also have this other side that I get how, you know, we feel towards the that other side. So for me, it was like trying to bridge the two worlds together, answer questions or bring up things that a lot of people are talking about. And now at the same time that you're doing this, fine tuning your craft, you're slipped out of sobriety and went back to drinking, right? Yeah. I, I, I always had like a, I was like two years, so two and a half years sober. And it just kept, you know, every time I get to that point, I, I you know, it, it was happening. And were you now again, during that period, were you smoking too at the same time? I, I was, I still was smoking. Yep. I was doing, I was doing both. Um, You know, the liquor at the time was overpowering everything. Cause you know, I was, passing out anywhere or, you know, by the time I got home, it was like very, um, it wasn't as helpful for me up until my, my later years. Gotcha. And now, I mean, so you said, you said earlier that you've been in and out of this four times, right? Three, three times. This is my fourth time, uh, doing it again. Sober. You're sober now. How long you've been sober now? Sober now. I'm a year and four months. Gotcha. And does that weigh heavy on you? I mean, do do, do you try to count the days or you just would rather wake up and say, well, I'm a year and eight months. I'm a year and two years. Or do you (laughs) actually look at the time? No, I I was doing that uh, uh, up to a year. And now if I get, you know, now it's like the half marks or the full years. 
Mm-hmm. But I'm, you know, more so now it's just a life choice for me. Um, for that year, it was difficult for me to get to, but seeing that mark was like, oh, okay, I'm here and I can't, I feel like I can't go back. And then for, for you right now, I mean, let's talk a little bit about what these struggles are, because I think that's what people don't really understand. I mean, it's almost like that bottle's calling your name. Yeah. Hey, yeah. What you doing, girl, man? I got something. Oh, yeah. Come on up here. Right? And it's, always, that's, and, it, and it's always back there in the back, right? Yeah. Scratching on the back of your neck, scratching on your booty a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what, 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 what do you got to do to like, I mean, what do you do to tell it, shut up? Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, I realize uh, people, you know, who are, who are getting sober and they have help, a lot of them aren't trying to heal. Um, and healing has been a big thing for me. So healing meaning um, talking to my father and, and literally having a conversation for, from a guy that wasn't in my life that, you know, it affected me. But also, I actually having that phone call and that conversation and then getting to meet him and spend time with him and understand his side. That was a very healing process for me. Um, So anything in my life that I I feel like I can look at things now and go, man, that probably came from when I was younger or or somebody told me not to speak or I'm stupid or whatever, you know? So I find those moments and the healing thing is a big, um, big moment for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I did it during the pandemic. I did it during the pandemic. Well, um, let's talk about that because I mean, during yeah. the pandemic, there, this was a this was a trying time on everyone. I think we note that alcohol sales went up, but we also do recognize clearly that cannabis sales went up. Yeah. Um, out of the thirty-seven states in the District of Columbia, the majority of them considered cannabis and dispensaries an essential service. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think that means that to me, the nation recognized that we better not take that. Right. <laughs> we got people in the streets every single night. We take Absolutely. that away. Oh my goodness. Like they, the ones that forgot to go out that night, go to get that. <laughs> right? it's, it's very real. The pandemic was tough and I, I was, I was going hard in the pandemic for a minute. Um, but I, I think that with everything that I was seeing around people dying every day and, you know, all those things, I, I felt very uh, ungrateful for for doing this stuff to myself. It's like I'm killing myself slowly while people who want to live are dying for no reason. Um, so I felt very ungrateful. My grandma passed um, and then my niece was born. And my niece, you know, when we talk about having a baby and stuff like that, my my brother, you know, that's that's the intimate, intimate family. And so for my mother, me and my brother, this is the only niece grandchild that we have in our circle. And mm-hmm. I think I think knowing my brother told, you know, I had to get right for her. I wouldn't have been able to have been in her life had I still been drinking. Gotcha. I mean, was that was that self-imposed exile or was that kind of a family imposed exile? It was, it was self-imposed. I think when you wake up one day and you just go. I was bleeding out of my nose. I was throwing up blood. I I felt my organs swelling up and I I still got to wake up the next day. You know what I mean? It was like, it It started all over again. It it started all over again. And, you know, which is, which is why, you know, I even went through the things of trying to be completely sober. And again, I love this cannabis movement because for one, they got three levels three levels of ways you could feel. I love that I can be calm and have sativa and still be able to function throughout the day. I love that for my insomnia, if I need to go to sleep, I can do my indica and and relax very nicely (laughs) without still being aware of life. Right. Right. And being able to function. And, right. And, right. Do you, do you, let me ask you a question. This is, this is a crazy one. Do you imbibe before you go out on stage? I don't. You don't. I don't. I, I want to, uh, it's a practice for me to not necessarily do stuff to um, make me feel like it's helping, if that makes sense. Yeah. I guess I, I, I do understand. You know, it's really kind of strange. I don't think I've ever shared with people, but I probably, you know, I did well over 3,200 television shows. 
And I was probably, I imbibed for 3,100 of them. <laughs> but for me, but for me, it was different. I wasn't imbibing for the show. I yeah. was really imbibing to get through the day. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, the pain threshold that I was dealing with back then was such that, I mean, I, I, I wake and bake every day. Yeah. You know what I mean, and then baking, uh, you know, an hour before I did the, the prep meeting. Yeah. It, cannabis never has never affected my short term memory or my long term memory in ways that it does for other people. So, like, I could literally, you know, take two, three hits, walk out and speak before 20,000 people for yeah. an hour break and not yeah. beat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, but, you're not. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You're not doing the whole the whole chief thing. You're not uh, doing well, what some, some rappers and stuff do. <laughs> well, but you know, I mean, the, you know, some of the rappers, I think, you know, there was a very now in in the last couple of years, I've kind of slowed down a little bit. But I can tell you that back when uh, during my production days, I literally, I don't know if there's too many people who could stay in the same room with me. You know what I mean for a long period of time because. <laughs> It was just like that. I'm sorry. I got now. Of course, I built up a big tolerance, right? On, and I, you know, back before, and you got to remember, I go back to 2001, 2002, long before cannabis was vogue, long before everybody was like, before there were dispensaries all over the country. Yeah, you know, I literally was sneaking in my bath, in my in my dressing room, going to the bathroom, cutting on the shower, and then you know, taking a couple of hits and blowing it into the water so the water would take it down. You know what I mean? And then. And then, you know, open the door and have a meeting of all the producers and, you know, other people and sit there for an hour straight. You know, I, they, and, you know, That's I don't know. <laughs> you know That's all, why we rocked with you so much. We was like, it's something about Monty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was kind of always on the case. I wonder why. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah. And, and, but it also, I will tell you, some of the perspectives, and I, I recognize it clearly, you know, from a creativity standpoint, some of my perspectives on different issues I know were based on the fact that I was a little high rather than, <laughs> so, you know, I might call you out for just being stuck on stupid. Right, because, right. You know, why? <laughs> Are you so stupid? I can, you know, um, and I always just call people out, and I, I realize when the when you know five or three, two, one, the show is over. I'm like, damn, did you really say? You that? ain't even oh, say. Wow. Yeah, I guess you, you were didn't, thinking you know. it. You wasn't That's supposed right. to say I, it. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking it, but it actually came out. Ooh, ooh that inside mouth just opened up. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Have you, have you ever tried being on stage a little high? I have. I have. And and sometimes it's cool, but I'm very like, uh, especially when you working on new material and you're trying to right. pull that hour together. Um, I just it's I just like being clear in all on all manners. I, I don't yeah. want any excuse to why something did uh, didn't go right or did. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And, you know, I mean, it, there is the the inevitable, you know, whenever you aren't being as clear as you should be. You know, you can miss a beat. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you miss, and you know, timing is everything in yeah. comedy. But, you know, you miss a beat, you'd be like, yeah. uh oh, sorry about Wait. that. Right. Let's talk that one over here. But I remember now, I got it, I got it, right? Right? It's, so, it's, it's worse to bomb high and not know how to pick it back up. Oh, I can, I can imagine you getting caught. You know, I think well, only, only I, I believe it was one time I remember, I won't, I don't remember the audience I had to speak before, but I was, I, you know, I used to speak, I speak all over the country. Yeah. And was getting ready to speak in an event. And I kid you not, I walked into this room, when I looked out that curtain, I was like, damn, there was, I'm telling you, like 4,700 people sitting in this ballroom area waiting for me to come out. And I was like, hmm. Let me just so my feet don't hurt by right. midway. Let me go back here and take another little little tuck. And you know, you know, you know when you when you you are at ninety nine percent, and you think, well, I just do enough to get to a hundred. Yeah. But what you, did, you did enough to get to one hundred and twenty, and I did. I did enough to get hundred. And I, I was like, I was on a group. I was like rolling. I came out for the place erupted. I was like, you know, on my mark. Every single thing coming out of my mouth was dead. I was getting big applause, people standing up in the room. And then I'm telling you, I went to tell them one story. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I 
It kicked in. <laughs> and, I, 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 and I was like, what was I just saying to you? And then it's it was like you said, you said, so I said, oh, got it. I went right back on it again. And I, I clearly made it up, but I, I left that room thinking, Every one of them 4,600 people were looking at me like I was an idiot. How stupid can you be? Don't ever do that again. Right, right. right. Yep. Because <laughs> you never you know. Could, you just got to end with the, the Lord left me. He used me. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. He, he, he used me to make sure I understood the example. You ain't got to get too high, idiot. You know what I mean? So how are things going now? Tell me about what's happening. You got a couple of different shows, different things that you're working on. You're working on a a, a project with Wanda Sykes, right? Uh, well, we did. It was Wanda Sykes and Tiffany Haddish. Uh, we did They Ready, uh, which is on Netflix, uh, episode six. That's mine. Um, mm -hmm. But that was a Wanda Sykes. It was a produ her production as well as Tiffany Haddish. I will be watching that this afternoon. <laughs> Guaranteed. I'm gonna go get myself, you know, right and sit down and get me some get, get a couple laughs in for sure. <laughs> and what else are you working on? Um, so right now, you know, during the pandemic, I wind up uh building and creating different things. You know, we all know that a lot of businesses, especially for entertainers, had kind of closed and dropped down in business. Mm -hmm. So I built a, a virtual comedy club uh, that I do once a month. Uh, my next show is October 12th. It's called House Arrest Virtual Comedy Club. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's like the closest thing to feeling like you're in front of an audience, but it's in my it's in my place. Well, then, throw out, throw out. How can people see it? Make sure you throw oh, it yeah, out. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Come on, man. Give me promotion. Man. <laughs> That's on my website, uh, cwayans.com. Everything that I have is cwayans that, that you can find, or you could just look up House Arrest Virtual Comedy Club on Eventbrite. And you offer a platform for other comedians to come on and do their thing, right? Absolutely. You know, like I said, especially like in Cali, there's three main clubs, right? And it's already hard to get in there with the local celebrities getting on stage. Mm -hmm. But this pandemic really closed that line for up and coming comedians. And there is a world of talent out there that people don't put out in the front. And that's what that's what I wanted to build. There's so many funny people that people should know. Um, and I wanted to showcase that. But now let me, let me ask you a question. How do you get the same feeling when you're not there with a person? I mean, you, you, I, like you and I right now can look at each other. Yeah. But when you're doing your stick, do you actually get an opportunity to see some of the audience members in this virtual setting? So here, here's the beauty. It's as if you, me and you would be the audience right now. And I would just, I would be the performers right here performing. So I get to hear your laughter. I get to see you and you get to do the same thing. Now gotcha. there's two versions of it because there's this version and then there's uh, the live stream. So the live stream, cause I did that for a little bit of time, but the live stream just sees the video. Got that, it. That's what you call the general admission. Gotcha. General admission. Okay. Yeah. But, now, but but even for that, do, do, you, do you find it a little bit more difficult to be able to communicate and get through to an audience virtually rather than being there? You know, I did, I did a, I, I, one of, one of the, you know, the, the treats of my life, I did a, um, a stent off Broadway, uh, not off, off Broadway, but off Broadway. I did a play that was called the exonerated, which was, you know, uh, they ended up making it into a USA movie, and it was it was a, it was a, a play that was written kind of like I don't know if you remember the vagina monologues. I do. <laughs> it was a play. It was a play that was written that way, where there are ten performers on the stage or sitting there. It's kind of like a glorified reading in a sense, but not really a reading because you're there looking at the script in front of you, and they changed. There were there were four or five five of the cast members that are interchangeable every single week. So they had celebrities in five of the roles and the other, there was a, you know, one, two, three, four, five members of the cast that were permanent. And so, you know, you would literally hit the stage. I, I tell you some crazy stories. I, I, I literally did this play with the intention of only doing a week and ended up doing 10 weeks and traveling with it. Wow. So that was at least, you know, it was one of those little passing back that I must've been doing a good enough job that the directors and the producers wanted me to travel with them. So I, you know, but I got to do it with, you know, Billy D Williams, um, nice. um, uh, Brian Dennehy. I did it with so many different celebrities who were on the stage and, you know, it was one of those really, it, 
things where, you know, every single night what was really kind of cool because, again, there's not a lot of huge lighting on the stage. You're just sitting there. There's 10 people on the stage and there's little overhead lights down on you. So it, it directs down onto your music stand where your script would be. But I could see clearly all the way through to the back row. You know, and the, the theater that we use in Manhattan, oh, I think it was maybe 600 people, 700 people. The theaters around the country, there were 1,200 to 1,300 people in these places. You know what I mean? And so while you're sitting there performing, you know, you can look out at that audience and see that audience waiting for your next words. So, you know, if you didn't register or <laughs> you knew you weren't doing a good enough job. Right, right. And, and, and I, like, I like this medium. I, I enjoy being able to, to talk to people because I think that, you know, once we get started and our conversations begin, this becomes much more intimate than it seems right. to be. Right. However, I couldn't see trying to be a comedian and do this. I don't know. Talk, talk to me about this. So I, I'll say this. I'll say in the beginning, it was scary as heck. Um, I remember people asking to just do Zoom meetings. So instead of I, we would literally be sitting here like this and I'm trying to make you laugh. That was a different feel to me. So I'll say the last actual Zoom show I did in that setting, I held a microphone in my hand and still sat down and it felt better. The, the biggest problem with the virtual is the lagging, the Wi-Fi, those type of things, right? So if you can get that in place and to still hear the laughs, it's, it's still better than not having a platform. But for me, through that pandemic, to have to to have to make somebody laugh through this virtual space, it made it made me stronger. It made me a different beast. And I think anybody who was using social media to figure out how to just talk to people or get jokes in, it they came out of this pandemic way stronger. Does it does it change your timing? Does that change a little bit, or do you, can you, do you think about that? Not necessarily. I just feel like, you know, you you kind of have to get over the fact that they might be laughing after you thought they were going to laugh. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it's the kinks and stuff. It's like finding out whose Wi-Fi is worse and cutting them down so you don't have to hear their laughters. It's a lot of, listen, di this digital space is changing and it's only going to get better. And I don't I don't think the platform is going anywhere. Right. And, you know, like right now we're using, I don't know if, you're, if you've used this particular streaming service, we're using something called StreamYard to do yeah. hours. And I, it, it's it's literally made the difference, I think. Um, did I go away? Are you there? No, I see you. As, right, as we're saying this. But now see, they go, now, is that crazy? Now all of a sudden I can't <laughs> see you. They cut us <laughs> off. And no, I, I, well, you know what? I think I did. I hit the wrong button. For me, it's it, I. I am not that great of a technophile, you know. I'm one of baby boomers who haven't figured out how to use the computer the right way yet. <laughs> and I can hit a button, and next thing you know, I might be coming to you live from Mars or something. It's so strange. <laughs> wow. It's a it's a muscle to definitely try to um, you know figure out, but it it literally makes you stronger. It made me. I, I'm different now on stage. I will say that, and I think it's for the best. Have you been able to get out and do some live performances recently? Absolutely. Um, you to come I, back? Yeah, I, 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 I'm literally starting to get booked a lot more than I was, especially when I thought I was going to get booked more when my Netflix special dropped. You know, so mm -hmm. like that hit and was still a little slow, but now it's like it's coming. I'm in D.C. right now, Washington D.C. Uh, doing oh. five shows. Go ahead with your bets. So I'm, I'm from Baltimore. I'm a Baltimore boy. Hey. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna holler at some of my friends back there and say, you need to get down there and see her. Throw the okay. word out. I'll make sure I get the word out for you. I appreciate and it. Go ahead, go ahead, do a shameless plug right now, right now about Washington, D.C. Right now, I am in Washington, D.C. This is October 8th and 9th. I have four more shows left at the D.C. Comedy Law. All right, D.C. Comedy Law. And, and then let's talk a little bit about where, where do you like to be I mean, I, I know there's comedy clubs all over the country, but is there any one particular area of the country that stands out for you? Or like, you know, if I step on stage and so and so, I'm knocking this out the park. Oh, <laughs> there would be 25 girls standing out in the line waiting. <laughs> hey, 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 how you doing? <laughs> I, uh, oh, 
I, Orlando, I love New York. Um, Florida in general is pretty dope. But I'm going to say this. I performed last night in Washington. And this audience right here, they, they're they so dope and so open that I was like, I think I want to come back and shoot a special here. Gotcha. I got, I, and, and believe me, I'm not, this is not for any controversial reasons other than to ask the question. Yeah. Um, you are a very huge advocate for the LGBTQ community. And I was shocked, to be honest with you. I was shocked the other day. I was reading on, on one of these news services that all of a sudden there's this big pushback against Dave Chappelle for his last special, which I have not seen. So I, I don't even know what I'm commenting about. I saw the one before that um, where, you know, he he did, he, he, he fired up the LGBTQ community, but I don't think he did so in a disrespectful way. Now, and I'm sorry, because if I'm being disrespectful just by asking, please call me out. I don't You're going to be in trouble, Montel. Yeah. You, after this interview, you are going to the board of directors. Oh, no. <laughs> the they <game>. <laughs> They just, they just smack me on my head. Like, you know, like, what people don't even understand is that I have probably been one of the biggest friends of the LGBT community for the last 20 years, long before that was Vogue. I was one yeah. of the first people to actually have, you know, uh, LGBTQ members on my stage that I literally didn't call out or didn't identify, didn't make a big deal about. I, I've always felt myself to be you know, uh, as as open to and friendly with the communities I possibly can. And there was a period of time about mm, 13 years ago where I started hearing this underbelly rumbling that, you know, Montel's got a problem with gay people. I was like, I ain't got no problem with nobody. You best to back up off of me. Right, I got right. gay members. <laughs> I got, if I could, you know, I get gay friends. A gay friend of mine literally handled and was the wedding planner for my wedding. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't get it, but it's the one gay person you turned down for a picture or something that was right. like, oh, he is the worst. <laughs> I, I don't, but you know, and, and here my problem is, I, I swear to you, I can't. My, my wife says, teases me about it all the time because every once in a blue moon, you know, I might try to make you know some little comment. And she'll go, you, don't even try it. You right. cannot do that. You don't know how to do it. You look stupid. Stop. <laughs> and that resonates in my ear. You know, so I can't even make fun. But when right. I'm watching a special or something, and, and again, Tommy, am I wrong to have thought that his last special was funny? I I think Dave Chappelle is brilliant. I think his last special was funny. I could see how to see how it might affect affect someone who is not quite uh, sure about yeah. their identity, you know what I mean? But yeah. the, the real thing is we all have opinions. We all know we're so different and that's what we love about this world, right? But then we all want to, everyone to think like us. And I think there's generations that are separated. So for instance, you know, the older generation, they're pretty much stuck in their ways. They, they live for a certain amount of time to be who they are today. Now we got this new generation in who's kind of more open and vibing, but people are still adjusting. And now you got this other wave generation that's coming in full force. Dave has a platform to be able to speak for people and ask questions or bring up questions for us to have a conversation about. For me, in this special, his closer was, was special. To me, it was probably one of his best ones. And it brings up something. It comes full circle, full, full circle. But also, Dave likes to uh, pinch. What, what is it called? Push those boundaries to instigate. But it's really for you to think about. Even myself, being a gay person, gay doesn't help me get out of a, a police situation quicker. You know what I'm saying? Right, it's right. Still, I'm still black. And I've still been followed by the cops. I've still been, you know, the things they said to me when I did get locked up for my DUI. It's it's heartbreaking. So there's this white community and these people who are pushing in a different way. But at the end of the day, it's sad to go. The these people are getting rights in a matter of weeks when black people are still trying to find that equality. Right. And and we should say that these people who are not 
black and gay are getting rights. The black gay people right. are getting gay rights. Right. We still we still fighting. Still fighting. Right. So I, I, I didn't understand that. I don't think that Netflix took this thing down. So I'm going to try to watch that again. So watch that one. Tonight. Watch it as soon as. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 beautiful. And when you see the full circle, it's like, wow. But, you know, it's like, you know, you had arguments with people and you trying to say something to them and they pick the one thing that wasn't even a part of your message. You like right. Missed the whole conversation. We I just wasn't saying that. That's not. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I gotta tell you, there are times I get completely. You know, uh, we've we've been fortunate with Let's Be Blunt that we've navigated. You know, this space being able to talk about cannabis and talk about it in a you know uh, the correct way. I think what I think is the correct way, and and give information and try to make people understand. But every once in a blue moon. You know, somebody might say one line on one of my, you know, uh, uh, episodes and, you know, next thing you know, we get bounced out for five or six days until mm -hmm. they stop and listen to what the one line was. It wasn't what they thought it was. Right. You know? Exactly. If you play that back, that's why that's why sometimes you wish you had a playback just in your life. When you're walking along the street, you know, you right. walk down the street, and all of a sudden you, you, you bump into somebody, you go playback, excuse me, I didn't see you. Let me and they think you did I, I wish there was a there was a device like that where you could back up for five seconds, you know what I mean? Ten seconds. It's crazy. It's so crazy what's happening right now. But I think I think we need to just be able to have the conversation as long as no one's getting hurt in a right. violent way and not, you know, being malicious, then I think I, I think it's great topics to open up to. Well, you know, now, I gotta tell you, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just tell, I'm telling you, one of the things that I had the hardest time and for well, I understood LGBTQ. Then it was right. LGBTQ plus. Then it's uh, what's the plus sign for? Because we got there's I just <laughs> we got seventy eight uh, pronouns. Got it. We just it. came up with Z and Zer and. Zim. <laughs> <laughs> what the so, hell is Zim? What listen, is that? Whoever, whoever they want it to be. <laughs> hey, am I, am I, I Zim? I'm, look, no? I'm, I'm still trying to catch up, but you know, this is this is one of those things where it feel like we just opened a can of worms and people are gonna be walking around and go, call me orange juice. That's yeah, what no I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I call, yeah, call me call me doorknob. I don't know. <laughs> Can I want to make it. Huh? It's crazy. What do you what? think are some of the most pressing issues that are currently before the LGBT community? What are the most pressing issues? Before? Pressing issues. What do you What do you think are, are some of the? I mean, I know this disparity between black and white LGBTQ is probably to me one of the most you know pressing yeah. issues that needs to be addressed as a nation because you know and I'm not. Again, I don't need anybody hitting me over the head with no hammer. No, you know, no. But, but the but the truth is, you know, every time I look at you know one of these new streaming services, I see another transgendered African American person killed. Right. I don't read the same number of white Asian. I just see African Americans ones that are killed. When I see you know there was a, a group you know, attacked. They happen to be African-American gay people attacked. And I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, is that, and what is the, what is the LGBTQ community doing to see if they can come together? You know, I see the parades, I see people marching down the street arm in arm, but when the parade's done, I don't hear a lot of them speaking out, Caucasian gay people speaking out and saying, stop the violence against black gay people. Right. I'm sorry. And, I mean, I'm not trying to say that. No, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> no, and and now I'm going to correct myself because speaking back on Azizer and them, uh, the the anybody can be whatever they want. If, right. If you're happy and you're full of love, go go live that life. Right. Right. And in the scheme of things, we are all just adjusting. We we this is stuff we've never heard. I was telling somebody the other day. There's a whole video on YouTube with this chick. Um, living her life as a horse and she's, yeah, she's <laughs> <laughs> wait 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 okay, but see now we can't even talk about that because i feel like if we talk about that i'm gonna get in trouble because i'm not trying to make fun of a person who's living their life as a horse i'm really not 
But the oh, laugh geez. that you just did is because you don't see anybody living like that, right? So no, I never seen that in my life. You come winning in winning in my living room, I'm gonna be like, what? <laughs> oh, when you get off, go look up woman says she's a horse or woman okay. says she's a horse. It, but Ooh. <laughs> the gist the of it is that yes, again, we're in this place where the black it has nothing to do with LGBT, black first. And so, yes, people getting killed is still very taboo in the black community, but there's there's anger for different reasons. There's anger for, you know, people going, how, how are you making it harder for yourself when we haven't even did this? Or just, it it's, I can see how it could be frustrated to someone who is like, how are y'all passing laws? Prime example, we've been trying to pass a law for, for Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, right? We've been trying to find some type of equality in that. The Asian bill, it was like three people, sadly, that passed away or got beat up. And they passed that bill, Biden passed that bill in like a week or two. You, I, I, I can't be mad at the straight world or, or people who are frustrated with going, how are y'all making that happen so, so quickly? Right. And Where it's been hundreds of years and there's been hundreds of thousands of us murdered, hung from trees, and it's not a bill passed yet, right? We just going, please, like we just want a, a piece of it. So, so you know, where, where it comes to with the, you know, is the LGBT support and, and doing these things, it, it feels like they are because there's this social media world where we're, you know, all these eggs are coming out and having opinions about how everybody should be living and having opinions. But it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like that. And it's very sad that I feel like a lot of our my black LGBTQ plus community is not safe. You know, do you think we're headed backwards or do you think we're moving forward? Well, we don't have no other way but to move forward. Right. And, and what and whatever you do, I feel like as as much stuff as that, that seems crazy right now and it's changing, I feel like a lot of things are opening up. I feel like people are getting more uh in tune with themselves and what they are really made of and i th i honestly think this new generation of babies are beyond special i think they're super powerful and it's it's going to be interesting to see in the future absolutely hope we have a future for this new generation <laughs> you know, that's that's the one thing i you know i mean come on you when you, when you really stop and think about a time when and you, I, people say oh everything goes in cycles bullshit I mean, right. <laughs> it really right. doesn't do the cycles. You know, things can progress a little bit further forward when it takes two steps back. This time it takes two steps back with, with 100 pounds. Then right. next time it takes two steps back, it's speed with 1,000 pounds. Then 1,000 right. pounds. It's not like we actually continue to move in a direction or a trajectory that makes things better. So I'm hoping that this new generation has an opportunity to express themselves, live, and let live yeah. the way I think that they act like. Because, you know, I have... I have you know, some, some of those zeers in my family that are my kids who, you know, sometimes I look at them and I think, you know, geez, I, I don't understand why America seems to act like we have the racist issues that we have when you look at that generation and they just get along. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, when, when, when you, your shows are your shows multi-ethnic, I mean, multi, multi yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So people, people, everybody, every walk of life come everybody out. Everybody, old, young, um, you know, white, black, Spanish. Like I get, I get a lot of, you know, especially in just different areas. But I've, I've met them all. One of, one of the beautiful things where, where I'll, I'll touch on Dave Chappelle too is you're bringing, you're bringing all types of people to your show, right? To hear this right. and to find some trying to type of understanding. I love seeing people at my show and people telling me to be a certain way because. When my earlier years, I did my jokes. I've had a pastor come up to me, you know, tell you ain't right, but you funny, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. good enough, right? Mm -hmm. I've had, I've, I've said my jokes and had parents come up to me who whose daughter just came out of the closet, and I was able to talk to them both, and that that means something. So this is why that platform and and bringing humor to something that could be so hard in life to deal with is a necessity a necessity excuse me mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your podcast you got a podcast called menace to sobriety 
Yes, uh, Minister Sobriety, my boy, dope boy. We do it uh, every Friday. Uh, but we started this because we're both sober, but we also both smoke still. Um, and and mm -hmm. so uh, it's it's basically us talking about our struggles with addiction and stuff in a com comedic way, mm -hmm. in our own way. <laughs> well, there you go. Now you, you're also working on something called Drive By Jokes. Drive by jokes. That's right. That's on my patreon.com backslash C Wayans. Uh, that's a series that I put together where I grab my friends. Uh, we do a little improv of what's going on around us. And if you don't make me laugh, you get dropped off where you bombed. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that was, that'll make you step correct immediately. Yeah. Right? <laughs> You ain't kidding. You better come over. You better have your top 10 jokes lined up, ready to go. No, they only get to talk about what's around, what we're driving past. Oh, my goodness. If so, you can't find any humor in it, it's just done. You, get out. You get you get out and you actually get a chance to make somebody laugh on the street. That's your oh. only savior. And if you can't make them laugh, bye-bye. <laughs> well, what is, what is your ultimate goal in life, my dear? Listen, I'm going a, I'm to a sell a show. Uh, I'm a, I'm a stay creative. I always want to be a part of stand up, but my ultimate goal is to just get to a place where I can create and live my life in the background. <laughs> mm. That's my dream. I'm moving to Hawaii. Uh, I start my family, but I'll have some income coming in and invest investing in stuff. That's my ultimate. Sure. Well, your, your next live virtual comedy show house arrest live is October 12th. Yes. Uh, tell our listeners where you know they can go to get tickets and how to tune into the show. That's cwayans.com. It's an online event. You go get your tickets, you get your link, and you come and you laugh. Cwayans.com. Cwayans.com. Well, I got to tell you, Shanta, I, 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 this has been just a joy for me. I got to thank you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blowing Montel. Um, I'm going to spread the word to everybody I know. Um, oh, I got two things. Um What's your opinion? Uh, two things. What's your opinion of the current administration, the president and the vice president, and their stand on cannabis? Because if you remember, I just want to—I just want to take you down memory lane. Let's go back two years ago when they were running for office. I kept hearing, "Oh, the first hundred days of the world, right. we're going to make sure legislation that will help and be favorable to cannabis." And then uh, about six months before. Oh, yeah. I remember one of them. Uh, I think it was the, the vice president-elect was on a show said, well, I smoked before myself. <laughs> I did it a few times. Um, but, but, you know, I, I was able to you know, turn around and recognize that she actually was responsible for more arrests during her tenure right. as attorney general than anybody in the past. But, okay. But still, and when we get in the office, you just keep, I remember she was on the uh, Charlemagne show. You just, you know, you get us in, we're going to 100 days, we're going to get us done. Hasn't it been like 150 days now and it ain't been done yet? Listen, they 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 put a a, a, cert, a evil face out there to have to choose this one. And when I say evil face, that doesn't mean what he was doing behind was evil. But I think they are doing a horrible job. I, uh, uh, they keep changing up stuff and we should have knew better. We should have, we should have known having both of them on the breakfast, the breakfast club alone, you know, right. they, it's, it's like they was getting on black planet dating apps. They was, uh, <laughs> they <want> BET rocking. <laughs> like we should know better. Yeah, when they like <laughs> yeah. it, was just like, it was just like when I'm showing up on the, uh, uh, or seeing a hall playing a soccer phone, remember that? Yeah, no, she back. Kamala came out in Tim's. She came out in t <laughs> we should have knew better when we saw when we saw that she couldn't dance in Tim's, we should have went the other way. Well, you know, I, I I'm gonna tell you, I have uh I I I've been keeping my mouth shut because she and I do have a past. Oh man, I don't know if you knew about that. Nah, you you uh I can't say it on this show. <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 I got you, to Google with you. You can Google it. It, it it's it's Googleable. Oh man! Um, but I I would the people would ask me back when before the November election. Well, of course you're going to vote for her, and I was like, 
Hey. 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 No, I'm just I, you know, I don't kiss and tell, and I'm not going to. I'm I I have to. What do you call it? I have to, you know, exclude myself. You know, yeah. recuse myself because you know I'm tainted in my own opinion. But um, yeah, it should have been buyers beware. Man, yeah, we should we should have knew better, but. This this is this is where we are. What and you gonna well, you do? Know, and now, okay, so I asked you that question. But now, what do you think 2024 is gonna look like, girlfriend? Because you know, Orange Man could be back. <clears throat> I, I think he might be. But on a, on a side note, I'll say hopefully we get that thirty something billion dollars back in them HBCU colleges that just went down. So that's, that's why I said you put an evil face in front, but you know, sometimes people do amazing things behind closed doors. It's, 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 it's amazing how things just flipped around. So I, I would hate to see the violence come back. Um, but yeah. unfortunately I feel like the economy was doing way better before. Right. You know, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid right now just because of the level of vitriol the level of anger the level uh, the, you know it's like everybody's like the, the fuses are so tightly wound it's like i wish we could just put a joint in every everybody's mailbox I'm not <laughs> <laughs> take a break for a minute to fire it up and just chill you know what i'm saying get it have a laugh listen to right to right but people know. You need to get one of them smoke uh, bombs that that blow out uh, weed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you, why not? Yeah. I mean, it's time yeah. to, to start. You know, I, 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 we tried everything else there is to try. I don't see any reason why we can't try this. Well, Shante Wayans, I can't say thank you enough for being a part of our show today. You. you know, you always have a home here whenever you want. All you got to do is just call us. Boom. I'd love to have you back. We could chop it up on thousands of things. I, I, I read me out. That's the other thing I was going to ask you about your opinion on. Redman was just on. Um, he's been on my show a couple of times. Hey. But, um, you know, he just started the National Cannabis Party. Have you heard about that? No. I'm, I'm trying to make sure everybody knows about this because we need to get the word out. This is a federally sanctioned uh, uh, party now called the National Cannabis Party that now can actually put candidates up in every state on every ballot that there is and can raise money, can raise funding, just like the Democratic Party, the Republican yeah. Party, the yeah. Party, they can now raise money as the National Cannabis Party to help put forth some of the agendas that we have in trying to make this world a peaceful place, a better place. I'm putting it down. National NCP. NCP. National Cannabis Party. NCP. So anything, you know, holla at him, send him a little note. He'll love to hear from you, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> I will. And again, <laughs> you are welcome back here anytime you want. And good luck. I hope you're knocking out the park for the rest of the week there in D.C. Give my homies a good a good show. <laughs> I will. This has been amazing. I'm so, I'm so grateful to do this with you. And thank you again for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.